All right, welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Robin Lawrence and I am the Principal Holistic Healthcare Provider, Principal Chiropractor here at Getwell Family Chiropractic. Dr. Sarah Ponica will be joining us here in just a moment as we get ready to talk to you all about brain health and how absolutely important the master organ of your body is. And we're gonna give you some tips on how to take care of it, things to look for, and we'll probably ad lib a little bit off of our planned script because we wanna, you know, we make sure, just you all know, we always have a script because we wanna make sure that we get through all of the really important points every time. And here she comes to join us. Yay! Um, so I, as we get started here, if there's anybody that you know that may be concerned about brain health, please share this topic with them right now so they can join us. Maybe start a watch party or, you know, just really share the heck out of it on your timeline so that way we could really get this discussion going tonight. Right? It's so exciting. All right. Okay. Can you Sorry. Join? No, you're. I am sharing. Share. Yes. Yeah. So Dr. Sarah is sharing, and then we are going to get started. All right. Love it. So, what is the brain? It's a big old mush of gray matter. It's a blob. It's a blob. The brain, in fact, is an organ that acts as the main control center of our bodies. It does, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it's very complex. <laughs> this very complex organ controls our intelligence, um, it controls the senses, uh, body movement, and behavior. And, Just to name a few. Yeah, <laughs> and much, much more. Uh, the brain weighs approximately three pounds, depending on how large you are, pretty much, and it makes up about 2% of our body weight. And within the last 10 years, we have begun to understand more about the brain than all the past centuries combined. The brain can be divided into three different sections, including the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. And we are going to take a little bit of a deeper look into each section. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go kind of detailed in here, but That's I think awesome. it's interesting. Really? <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. Can we have the next slide, too? Or did you remember? Oh, all right, so brain anatomy, right? So the three sections of the brain house different kinds of anatomy. The forebrain contains the largest and most developed part of the brain and houses the cerebrum, right? The midbrain houses the uppermost part of our brain stem, and then the hindbrain contains the upper part of the spinal cord the brain stem, and the tissue that's called the cerebellum. The three primary parts are cerebrum, cerebellum, and brain stem. The cerebrum is divided into four lobes. We have a frontal lobe, parietal lobes, temporal lobes, and our brain stem. The cerebrum is the largest part of the brain and is composed of right and left hemispheres. The brainstem includes the midbrain, a thing called the pons, and another one called the medulla. And then the cerebellum is located right underneath the cerebrum. Between the cerebrum and the brainstem lie the thalamus and the hypothalamus, which are really important hormone makers. And the cerebral cortex coats the surface of the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And so, you don't, guys don't have to take notes. Yeah. <laughs> if you would like any of this information or any of these slides, we are more than happy to put Absolutely. it either in the chat, text it, or email it to you. Um, and, you know, just so you're all familiar with the anatomy of the brain as we talk about what the brain does. That's what I was going to say. In chiropractic school, one of our hardest classes was our neuro class, our neuroanatomy oh, class. Oh, yeah. Because we had to learn every single you know, area of the brain, every aspect of it. So to say, oh, the three main parts of the brain, that's only in one right? Exactly. <laughs> one circumstance. Exactly. And they don't need to know that there are nuclei and right. gyri gyruses and mm -hmm. 
those other things. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on to some of the functions of the brain. So the forebrain, which is mostly the cerebrum, um, so within that, the frontal lobe here in the front mm -hmm. holds memories, which allow you to plan, imagine, and think. That's where we do a lot of our reasoning. Um, the parietal lobe is going to translate the senses like touch, vision, hearing, and also speech, reasoning, and emotions. And that parietal lobe is also important for spatial orientation and navigation. So understanding where you are in space. Mm -hmm. And then the temporal lobe processes sound and language, and it houses the hippocampus and the amygdala, which play really big roles in memory and emotion, respectively. Mm -hmm. And the occipital lobe, which is in the back, is responsible for visual processing, and it allows you to recognize your friends and read books. Mm -hmm. The midbrain houses the brainstem and the brainstem relays information between the brain and the rest of the body and automatic functions like breathing heart rate and body temperature are all controlled within our brainstem and then the hind brain has our cerebellum and the cerebellum coordinates um, muscle movement and motor control to maintain our posture and balance mm -hmm. and um, the thalamus, which mm -hmm. is another structure yes. <laughs> in the brain, um, that relays our sensory and motor signals to the cortex, and it's involved in regulating consciousness, sleep, and alertness. Mm -hmm. And then we have the hypothalamus, which connects the nervous system to the endocrine system, um, where hormones are produced via the pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. And finally here, the cerebral cortex is where most information is actually processed in the brain. It's true, and then I forgot to open up. That way if there are any comments down below, we can mm -hmm. answer them as quickly as possible. All right, now, there's the big argument, right? Are you left brain or are you right brain? Right. So the human brain clearly is divided into two hemispheres, right? The right hemisphere and the left, right? And it's connected by a bundle of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. Theories surrounding left-right brain dominance state that each side controls different styles of thinking. The left brain theory was originated by Nobel Prize winner Roger W. Sperry in 1981. 1981, right? And here I'm thinking this left-right brain thing has been around forever, right? right? But oh no, 1981. Each side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. For example, the left brain is going to control the right muscles, right? The left brain thinkers are said to be more logical, analytical, and objective. Traits of a left brain thinker include language, logic, critical thinking, numbers, and reasoning. And then the right brainers, right, they're more intuitive, they're thoughtful, they're subjective. Uh, traits of a right brain include facial recognition, emotion expression, music, reading, color, imagination, intuition, and creativity. And can anybody guess which brain I am? Uh, right? <laughs> I would say right, yes. But maybe a little left in there on occasion when it has to be active. Neurological disorders. So why is brain health so important? A healthy brain functions quickly and automatically. Um, so one in five people in the U.S. suffers from a neurological disorder, which are diseases of the brain, spine, and the nerves connecting them. The National Institute of Neurological Disorders report the following as common disorders. Mm -hmm. So we have neurogenetic diseases such as Huntington's disease and muscular, dystroph muscular dystrophy, developmental disorders like cerebral palsy, Degenerative diseases of adult life, such as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Metabolic diseases, like Gaucher's disease. Uh, cerebrovascular diseases, like strokes and vascular dementia. Trauma, such as spinal cord and head injuries. My nephew just had one of those. Yeah, he sure did. <laughs> Poor guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, convulsive disorders, like epilepsy. Infectious diseases, such as AIDS dementia and brain tumors. Mm -hmm. So let's take a deeper look into a few different neurological disorders. Yeah. 
So dementia is really considered a cerebrovascular disease, but it is not a specific disease. It is a general term to describe a decline in our mental ability. Dementia describes a wide range of symptoms. For a condition to be considered dementia, at least two of the following must be significantly impaired. Memory, communication and language, ability to focus and pay attention, reasoning and judgment, and visual perception. Dementia is caused by brain cell damage, which impairs communication in the brain and may cause short-term memory loss. There are many forms of dementia and they are progressive, meaning the symptoms get worse as time goes on. While there is no cure for dementia, some treatment options are available. And a number of prevention strategies dun, 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 have been identified as helpful for reducing risk. And we're really going to discuss those later more in detail. I keep shaking the desk again. I apologize, mm -hmm. y'all. Prevention strategies can fall into three categories, right? Cardiovascular risk factors, right? Mm -hmm. um, physical exercise and diet, right? Oh, the diet's so important. <laughs> All right. Hi, Linda. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Mom. So Alzheimer's is a degenerative disease and the most common form of dementia. And it causes problems with memory, thinking, and behavior. Over 5 million Americans live with Alzheimer's and one in 10 people over the age of 65 has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Early onset Alzheimer's affects approximately 200,000 Americans under the age of 65. It's amazing. Minor changes in the brain occur long before the symptoms really start to show too. Yeah. And so some prevention factors um, for Alzheimer's, overconsumption of fat and carbohydrate are at the heart of the Alzheimer's epidemic. Mm -hmm. And risk of Alzheimer's is doubled in type two diabetics. Uh, and then heart disease also increases your risk of dementia as arterial stiffness is associated with the buildup of beta amyloid plaque in your brain. And that is a hallmark that is seen in Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. All right, so now a stroke is considered an attack of the brain. A stroke occurs by obstruction of blood flow to the brain, causing brain cells to die from a lack of oxygen. The effects of a stroke are dependent on whether, on where, not whether, on where it hits in the brain. Because one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body, different functions may be impaired. So strokes occurring on the right side, right, and this is really important because the sooner you can treat a stroke, the more successful the outcome will be. Mm -hmm. So right-sided strokes look a lot like paralysis on the left side of the body. The body cannot move. Vision problems, quick inquisitive behavior style. They ask a lot of questions um, and memory loss. Stroke occurring on the left side may lead to paralysis on the right side of the body. Speech or language problems. They're trying to say one particular word and it's not coming out the way they mm -hmm. want it to. Slow, cautious behavior. And of course, memory loss. Now, a few stroke facts. 800,000 new or recurring strokes happen every year. Up to 80% of the strokes, 80% can be prevented. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. And stroke is the leading cause of adult disability in the United mm -hmm. States. 80% of them can be prevented, yeah. right? And it's the leading cause of disability in adults. <sighs> so much work to do, Dr. Sarah. I know. We're on a mission. It's time to save the world. Time to save the world. <laughs> So as a parent or a grandparent, you always want what's best for your child or grandchild. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously. David, thank you for joining us. So here are some suggestions for neurological problem prevention from energyconnectiontherapies.com. So focus on nutrition. You want to provide local and organic produce to reduce the intake of pesticides. Mm -hmm. Also ensure that your child is drinking plenty of water because that will help remove all those toxins from their bodies. And then we also want to make sure we talk about clean water in there as well. Because some of, so for those of you that don't know, I'm mean, going to told you we'd ad lib a little bit here. And I'm going to interject. Um, 
alternative living water, the water that we drink out of bottles and the water that's coming out of our taps is filled with drugs, pesticides, alkalis, lies, chlorine, fluoride, all sorts of nasty it's things. Filled with lies. Right? It's lies, <laughs> right? We're trying to wash pesticides off our foods when we have water that's really just going to poison them right back. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this alternative living water that hydrates better, it cleans things off your foods, um, and will actually penetrate the cells of the nervous system, um, put it in the chat and I'll make sure I get you some more information on that. Dr. Sarah, I apologize for interrupting. Oh, not a problem. So we can also mm -hmm. Um, avoid heavily processed foods, trans fats, high sugar, and artificial sweeteners. Mm -hmm. And then also work towards a toxin-free environment is mm -hmm. really important for our kids. Um, you'll want to utilize natural cleaners around the house. Avoid fabrics that are treated with flame retardants. And then also look for natural fiber furniture. It's hard to avoid those flame, like I mean, that's what's all our, the sleepers are, right? They're flame mm -hmm. retardant sleepers, but yeah. I get it. There's a, there's a balance, definitely a balance there. Right. Um, yeah. And you know, the toxin free environment, it really even starts before the baby's even born. You know, they're finding 300 different chemicals in the blood of the umbilical cords of mm -hmm. newborn babies these days. So we can also avoid skin irritants. So that can mean looking for natural sunscreens to avoid exposure to chemicals and maybe try cloth diapers to avoid exposure to chemicals used in those disposable diapers um, to keep the wetness away. Not to mention we'll stop filling up the landfills. Anyway, mm -hmm. so I am like totally interjecting and welcome uh, Deborah and Anne. Thanks for joining us. Hello. I'm guessing that my mom started a watch party because I know all of these people. Right on. <laughs> Love it. All right, and then next, when it comes to dentistry, you want to look for a holistic dentist because we want to avoid that overuse of fluoride and avoid those mercury-containing fillings. And finally, encourage healthy development in our children. We want to encourage frequent physical activity and incorporate brain gym exercises. Yes, you can Google brain gym. And then limit screen time. That Just not right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the kids. Watch now. Limit this kid. Limit for the for kids. For the kids. Got it. Limit TVs, <laughs> computers, all of that. Definitely. Which is hard with online learning these days, too. All right. Right? All right. So that was kid prevention. Now, we're adults now. How do we prevent as adults? Oh, my gosh. There are so many lifestyle habits that we can adopt and maintain to maintain our brain health. Uh, lifestyle changes really can be broken down into four categories, right? Physical health and exercise, diet and nutrition, cognitive activity, and social engagement, which is so important. Now, these categories have been shown to reliably, reliably help keep your body and brain healthy to potentially reduce your risk of cognitive decline, right? Just because you get older doesn't mean you have to decline. Just because it's common, you don't have to agree with it. Research has found combining activities, what, combination of things, mm -hmm. of each category has a great impact on maintaining or improving your brain health at any single activity, more than any single activity. And we're going to discuss ways to incorporate these categories into your lifestyle, right? That's what we want. Time for some fun. <laughs> I'm all about fun. All right. Break a sweat. Okay. I got to. <laughs> Many studies have found an association between physical activity and a reduced risk of cognitive decline. Yeah. I like the sound of that. Me too. Try engaging in regular physical activity and cardiovascular exercise to elevate your heart rate, blood flow, and oxygen to the brain. Physical activities can be both mentally and socially engaging. What? Um, some things you could try would be walking with a friend, mm -hmm. taking a dance class. Zumba. I love Zumba. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mom, walking with a friend. Mom, taking a dance class. Yeah. Uh, joining an exercise class, going golfing, taking a tennis lesson, going to a pool, walking your dog, and going for bike rides. Yeah. Your dad does some of that stuff too, doesn't he? He runs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
And he sometimes forgets all things. Okay. He's, he's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. I see a little competition coming, Dad. <laughs> The World Health Organization recommends adults 18 to 60 should do at least 150 minutes of exercise per week. So that could be 30 minutes of exercise five days a week. And aerobic activity should be performed in at least 10 minute sessions. At least two days a week, you should also include muscle strengthening activities. So, so for somebody who doesn't understand the difference between just 150 minutes of exercise, aerobic means what, Dr. Sarah? <laughs> that like cardio yeah right so yes exactly so <laughs> elevating your heart rate right yeah so not so more than just like when you're walking with a friend mm -hmm. and you can still hold a conversation right you know this is something you're where getting, you're breathing hard right and your heart rate's up there yeah. yeah so if you don't already have like a fitbit or an apple mm -hmm. watch or you know a garmin or whatever there else is out there that can check your heart rate you know depending on your age, you got to calculate it, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, somewhere between like 127 and 133 is my aerobic heart rate, right? right? Anything below that, you're just not really getting very aerobic. Yeah. And I purchased my smart scale today. Yay! I love it. You're going to love it too. Okay. So here are some ideas to incorporate. Um, physical activity daily. So kind of easy things that you can do. Mm -hmm. So for leisure time activities, you can try walking, dancing, gardening, hiking, and swimming. For transportation, you can um, walk to work or mm -hmm. walk to where you need to go or cycle. Yeah. And even just doing household chores, vacuuming, cleaning windows, dusting, all of these are gonna kind of get you moving. Yep, absolutely. All right, so, you know, the adage goes, old dogs can't learn new tricks, but guess what? They can, right? As adults, continue to educate ourselves during any stage of life is really going to help to reduce our risk of cognitive decline. Obviously, we know a lot of these great resources, right? We've got local libraries all over the place. Even if they are doing curbside pickup, you know, you can still go online. There's apps to download books now to your Kindle or your tablet. Um, community centers really some are open a little bit right now but when you know when things are back fully open it's a great place to go and meet people and have conversation um, our rec centers even local colleges will have meetings or classes that you can audit for free um, and of course there's always online learning that's available as well you know topics for learning are endless pick whatever interests you right and look for that local class or check out that book um, some of the fun ideas, we took a poll and asked what some fun ideas would be. Um, local craft stores or home improvement stores for classes. I know they, the Home Depot does even kids classes, mm -hmm. right? You build a bird yeah, house. Bird house. <laughs> yes. Um, definitely look for books on cooking, which once I have my kitchen back, I'm excited to start cooking again. Um, I definitely want to learn how to make my own kombucha, right? Because I buy it at the grocery store and it's expensive. Yeah. Um, and I want to make my own. Um, you can teach yourself how to sew, knit, or crochet. Uh, one of the things I took on earlier this year that I'm going to tell one on myself has fallen off was I decided to teach myself to how to play guitar, mm -hmm. right? And I think I did about three or four lessons, and I haven't gone back to it. Um, gardening. And then, of course, you know, join an online group such as Skillshare.com, where you can pick up from thousands of classes. Currently, over 19,000 classes are available. Uh, categories are included but not limited to design, writing, technology, and photography. Amazing. It is. I found one of those websites and I signed up for a Spanish class and then I never went back to it. So I should do that. You're telling one on you too. I like it. Yes, right? So if we say, share that we said these things, then we'll be accountable to go exactly. back and do it. So we'll report back. Yes. All right, so there are many reasons to kick the habit of smoking, mm -hmm. um, but decreasing the risk of cognitive decline is another. Evidence shows that smoking increases that risk of cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. So here are some tips that can help you if you um, want to try to quit smoking. So number one, you want to find your reason. And that reason could be avoiding cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's avoid dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. Right, exactly. 
So whatever your reason is, keeping it clear in your mind will help motivate you and you're trying to quit. I'm actually going to modify that just a little bit, right? Because things that we keep in our mind often get lost. Right. How many times have we gone to the store with a list in our head and we forgot like two That's or three true. important things? Put it into existence. Put write it, it on down, a post note. Put it on a yeah. whiteboard. <laughs> you put little notes all over the place as to what your why is. And when you feel tempted to go back to it, you'll be like, oh, that's why, yeah. right? It's not stuck here. Mm -hmm. It's out in the world For in sure. existence. Yes. And then get prepared. Going cold turkey doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, so choose your method and set up a support system, such as maybe a friend to call when you're having trouble with fighting the urge. Mm -hmm. um, a third thing is replacement therapy, such as nicotine gum, can help with nicotine withdrawal symptoms. And then find new ways to reduce stress if that was why you were smoking. Yeah, right. Maybe a hot bubble bath or a walk, right? We talked about getting more active. Mm -hmm. A walk yep. might do that. And then finally, just avoid the triggers in the next in the first few weeks that you're trying to quit. So if you associate smoking with drinking, avoid drinking. And if you usually smoke after a meal, maybe try taking a walk mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> after that meal instead. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and be heart smart, right? Taking care of your heart and your brain is more, so if you're taking care of your heart, taking care of your brain is more likely to follow. Studies show risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stroke include obesity, high blood pressure, and diabetes, all negatively impact your cognitive health. Protect your brain by protecting your heart, by maintaining your blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar, within recommended limits and sustain a healthy weight. A healthy diet and regular exercise are key to heart protection. So a lot of people are like, well, what's this cholesterol thing all about, right? What is it? Well, it's this like waxy substance that's in your blood. It is necessary and it is created by our liver, right? And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Um, it builds cells in our body. Um, and you know, honestly, too much can be harmful if the body is inflamed and toxic and can't do what it's supposed to do. Um, you can get cholesterol from animal based foods such as meat and dairy. And like I just said, it's also made in your body by the liver. It's a hormone precursor. There are more than two types of cholesterol, but the two types that we know are the LDLs, the low density lipoproteins. They are considered bad, and I use air quotes there because for me, in my world of cholesterol, right, there's really no bads or goods, mm -hmm. um, but this is the general consensus and agreement, yeah. um, is that it? this is the one that um, contributes to the fatty buildup in arteries. And then your HDL, your high-density lipoprotein, is good um, because it gets rid of LDL. It's like a trash truck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now... Always check with your doctor um, for your optimal cholesterol range, and that is testing that we can do here at mm -hmm. the office. We can run lipid panels and look at inflammatory markers to really evaluate your risk, because some people will have elevated cholesterol and be still low risk. Mm -hmm. So really, it's about what's your risk. Come on out. Mm -hmm. Oh, blood pressure. I get one more. Yay. So blood pressure is recorded as two numbers, right? Systolic and diastolic. Your systolic blood pressure, or the upper number, indicates how much pressure your blood is exerting against the artery walls when the heart beats. Your diastolic blood pressure, or the lower number, indicates how much pressure your blood is exerting against your artery walls while the heart is resting. Typical systolic pressure, or the top number, is more important. Blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury and on a pressure gauge right? Um, normal levels, right? Systolic, less than 120. Diastolic, less than 80. Safety first. Oh. Yes, please. Oh, we're covering her happy, pretty face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Injuries to the brain can increase your risk of cognitive decline, and it's important to take safety precautions when possible. Obviously. Right, yes. So <laughs> wear a seatbelt, very important. Mm -hmm. um, use a helmet when you're riding a bike and take steps to prevent falls. Like holding onto the handrail when you're going up and down the stairs. Right. Picking things up off the floor that don't belong there. Yes. Or leaving the hose out in the yard. My, my grandmother, 
That's what she oh, did. No. Yeah, That's so my 91-year-old grandmother fell in the yard and broke her leg bone just below her hip the other day because yeah. the hose was in the yard. Poor lady. I know. I love my grandma. And another side note here, um, contact sports like football, rugby, and soccer have been known to cause recurring concussions in players. And this can lead to complications in the brain down the road. So it's really important to just consider this when you're allowing kids to get involved in these sorts of activities. Yeah. And back to falls, though, common factors contributing to falls, which we'll see how many Dr. Robin already got. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, inactivity oh. is a common cause of reduced balance, coordination, mm -hmm. and flexibility. Um, so to help with this, you can try yoga as a low impact activity to reduce your risk of fall. Mm -hmm. Also, poor vision can make tripping hazards and obstacles more difficult to see. Um, and then some prescriptions and over the counter medications can cause dizziness or dehydration, which contributes to falls. Oh, for sure. And this is it. This is it right? <laughs> You'll want to check your home environment for simple modifications like um, tacking down a loose rug um, to just avoid the yeah. chances of tripping. That's and a things great like that. Mm -hmm. It's coming. There it is, right? So, this is so important. Right? I think we're talking about this next week. Or yeah, we, we are. Yeah. Yeah. Next week, Sleep 101. Mm -hmm. Right. And this one, I think, alludes a lot of us to, right? Not getting enough sleep due to conditions like insomnia or sleep apnea may result in problems with memory and thinking. Insomnia can be caused by psychiatric or medical conditions, unhealthy sleep habits, uh, specific substances, and certain biological factors. So examples of medical conditions that can cause insomnia are right? Nasal and sinus allergies, because you're all congested and you can't sleep. Arthritis, because you're in pain. Asthma, um, chronic pain, low back pain, pain in general. Um, to get a better night's sleep, really one of the best ways is just to create a really great bedtime routine. So avoid using your computer or phone right before bedtime. And when I say right before bedtime, I mean 30 minutes, right? Shut it all down 30 minutes before you go to bed. Incorporate a few restful stretches into your bedtime routine. A warm bath or a hot shower can be very relaxing. Meditation can help. There's music all over YouTube that can help you to sleep. I use a couple of different ones every single night. Um, try reading a book, right? And one that's not scary or <laughs> intriguing, right? Something that's just going to calm your mind down. And definitely avoid caffeine beverages mm -hmm. late in the day. mental health and stress. So studies report an association between depression and an increased risk of cognitive decline. Managing stress can help reduce sy symptoms of depression, anxiety, and other mental health concerns. And there are many different techniques that you can try for managing stress. Um, physical activity releases your feel good mm -hmm. endorphins. Absolutely. Hey Jim, thanks for joining us. Deep breathing is going to lower those cortisol levels, which is that stress hormone. Mm -hmm. Yoga combines movement and breath for a potent stress reliever. And you can try a relaxing form of yoga, such as restorative yoga. Meditation teaches mindfulness and can have a positive effect on mood. And guided visualizations are a great way to help you Love start. Guided, med guided meditations. And then essential oils or aromatherapy can give you a boost here. And some calming scents include lavender, bergamot, um, frankincense, and geranium. Yeah. And just, again, another interjection here. So if you um, – I'm going to post it on the office Facebook page. But the Greater North County Chamber of Commerce every year hosts a women empowerment seminar. This is going to be our seventh one this year. And this year it's all online and it's free. 
So there's no reason for you to not register. And I am presenting uh, 20 minutes on essential oils mm -hmm. yep. and emotional health. So if you want to learn more about emotions and essential oils, um, I'll post it after we finish here. Be sure to check out the link and register. Um, we're also raffling off a couple of really cool purses. <laughs> um, and there's going to be goodie bags. So be sure to check it out. I'm excited. I need to sign up. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then journaling can also be a really good release for stress. Steven, thanks for joining us. All right, so, oh, socially engaged. How many of you are missing this deep <sighs> connection of social engagement, mm -hmm. right? I mean, literally, when you're with people, the happiness is dripping off the walls. And right now, where there's so much fear about being with people, and I wanna let you know, that, you know, be safe, take your precautions, but get out there and be with people. It's okay. Dr. Robin says so. Um, it really is going to help support your brain function, right? Pursue social activities that are really meaningful for you. You know, and here are some ideas of some social interactions that we came up with, right? Uh, find ways to be a part of your local community. Is there anything that you can volunteer at? Um, mm -hmm. I think Ferguson right now, is doing a spooktacular drive-through. Well, I know they're doing it. They may still be looking for additional um, cars to participate. So the, the kids are going to drive through in their cars with their trick-or-treat bags outside their car. And then we're going to be little pods, a car and like four people, and we're going to give them candy mm -hmm. and treats and have fun things. And our trunks are going to be decorated. So, you know, you can check out fergusoncity.org, I think might be the I name of the so, website. Yeah. Um, volunteer at the local library. You know, join a club to teach English or read to kids, right? And we can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. um, see if a local park needs any gardening volunteers. Animal shelters may be looking for some animal caretakers. Join a choir. Start your own book club, right? <laughs> and then uh, meetup.com. Is that? I think so. Yeah. What it's called? Yeah, for sure. Google it. <laughs> Google is our friend. <laughs> so mentally challenging activities are great for keeping your mind sharp. And challenging your mind might have short and long-term benefits for your brain. Mm -hmm. So try learning a new skill. Yeah. Like this guy is learning to play the guitar right. and Dr. Robin right. tried to. I, I, and then I quit. And then, well, I didn't quit. I got distracted. Got distracted, yes. yes. You can work on a puzzle, which that's one of my favorite things to do. I haven't mm -hmm. done that in a while. Um, participate in strategic games like bridge. Uh, learn how to play an instrument, mm -hmm. do something artistic like painting or scrapbooking, um, read a different style of books mm -hmm. that you normally do, and then journal or write poetry. Absolutely. Kathy, thanks for joining Hi, us. Hi, Kathy. All right. So, you know, we always, almost every class we touch on diet, right? Yeah. And how important your diet is. Now, there are actually foods that are brain foods. Um, typically, eating a well-balanced diet, which includes a high intake of fruits and vegetables, is low in fat and sugar, can reduce the risk of some co of cognitive decline, right? And we don't necessarily want a low-fat diet. So the research is really showing that the brain loves fat as a fuel source. It's the right fats that you have to eat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, diets such as the Mediterranean diet and DASH may contribute to risk reduction. Um, the red Mm -hmm. Mediterranean diet is a heart healthy diet, which may also protect the brain and incorporates different principles of healthy eating that are typically found in the areas around the Mediterranean Sea. It focuses on fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains. It replaces butter with healthy fats such as olive oil. Uh, definitely a reduced red meat intake, and that's huge because red meat is very acidic to the body anyway. Um, uses lots of herbs to flavor foods rather than salt. They eat a lot of fish, right? At least twice a week. One white fish, uh, such as tilapia, cod, cod's one of my favorites, haddock, catfish, and one fatty fish, such as salmon, albacore tuna, mackerel, and sardines. Those are my favorites. <laughs> yes, I had some salmon at lunch today. Now the DASH, right, stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So eat foods that are low in saturated fat, and salt. Eat more fruits and vegetables. Consume whole grains, uh, poultry, chicken, turkey, right, fish, and nuts. 
and limit your intake of bad fats, uh, red meats, sweets, and sugary beverages. Our supplements. Mm, yes. Some supplements are associated with improving our cognitive function. Consuming a healthy diet is the best way to achieve optimal nutrition, but sometimes it can be difficult getting all the nutrients we need in one day just from the foods that we're eating. Mm -hmm. So try the following supplements to boost memory, motivation, creativity, alertness, and general cognitive function. Fish oils, this is a really important one. Yes. Um, they are going to contain the healthy fats that are essential for maintaining the structure and function of your brain. And they have a host of anti-inflammatory effects too. Then we have um, resveratrol, which is a powerful antioxidant and it is found in deep purple and red colored fruits. And some studies show resveratrol could prevent the deterioration of the hippocampus, which is where our memories are stored. Mm -hmm. We also have ginkgo biloba, and this is an herbal supplement, supplement that can increase blood flow to the brain, and that is going to increase brain power. Absolutely. More blood, more oxygen, more brain. Mm-hmm. And rhodiola rosea, rosea. <laughs> this is a powerful supplement often used in Chinese medicine, and it promotes uh, well-being and healthy brain function. And then finally here we have phosph phosphatidylserine. Phosphatidylserine. <laughs> uh, that is a type of fat compound found in the brain, and some studies suggest taking phosphatidylserine Nicely supplements done. could be helpful for preserving brain health. Excellent. We've got Thomas and Brett with us now. Oh, no. <laughs> really? There's not more? You know what? Actually, I'm going to add before we go to the resources, right? Should we go back to supplements? No, don't go okay. back to supplements. <laughs> Chiropractic. Yes. The one thing we didn't talk about tonight, right? When we talk about brain health, right, and we talk about oxygen and blood flow to the brain, if you are someone who is on your phone a lot and you stand up and your head is very far forward of your shoulders, right? That forward head posture can reduce the blood flow and the oxygen flow to your brain by as much as 40%. And not having enough blood flow, which means your brain's not getting nutrients that it needs. It's not getting those healthy fatty acids that it needs. And it's not getting enough oxygen. It's not going to, it, it's going to be susceptible to decline. So simply getting a chiropractic adjustment on the regular and brewing exercises to bring that head back over your shoulders is going to improve the supply to the brain, which is critical, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in that, I thought of one other thing that I wanted to share, and then it went right out of my head. Uh, hmm. Rats. Mm -hmm. So I tell you what, if I think of it, I'm going to put it down in the comments in a little bit. That's really frustrating. I'm sure it'll come. Back. I'm sure it will. So, all right. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is all of the information we have for you tonight on brain health. Really hope that you learned something new, something that you could take away and put into use in your life right now, mm -hmm. right? And if you're interested in the resources, right, let us know. We'll post them in the comments, or like I said, we can email them um, out to you. Um, yeah, just let us know. Yeah, thanks again for joining us tonight. We know you probably have other things that you could be There's doing There's always other choices. But we're so happy that you came and joined us. Absolutely. Um, we, again, we hope that this class exceeded your expectations mm -hmm. and that you feel empowered and well-equipped with knowledge and resources to take your brain health to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, join us next week, next Tuesday at 6.15, right here on the Get Well Family Chiropractic Facebook page for our next Facebook Live class, which is Sleep 101. Twinkle, twinkle, little Hopefully star. Hopefully we can stay awake. I know, class. right? I hope we don't fall asleep during class. That would be bad. Oh, my goodness. And right here on this slide, we have a lot of information about our business and our office. Um, our website's here, phone number, if you are interested at all in um, 
getting to know a little bit more about chiropractic, seeing if it might be a benefit place that you need to be. Right, absolutely. Give for us sure. a call. And right now, um, until the middle of November, probably mid November, mm -hmm. we are running a new patient special. So if you bring 10 mm -hmm. non perishable food items, um, then you will receive. And your yeah. your very first visit, right? So on your first visit, you get your consultation. We're going to go through your health history. We're going to do a chiropractic exam. We're going to do a neurological exam. We actually have a computer that will look at the function of your nerve system and tell us where things aren't working properly. You're also going to get, on your next visit, a report of findings. So we're going to go through everything that we found and come up with a game plan to help you achieve the results that you're looking to achieve. And you're going to get your very first adjustment that day as well. Uh, yeah, so 10 non-perishable food items and 25 bucks gets you all of that. Yes. Well yes. said. Thank you. Yeah. And don't forget, like, I, we're really trying to push it out there. We do telehealth as well, mm -hmm. right? If you would like a nutrition consultation um, or want to talk about your brain health, you know, we can set up those appointments via Zoom as well. That is another service that we're offering now. And uh, we really just... We're here to be a beacon of light and hope for our community. You know, we're really here for people who are looking, seeking answers that they're not getting anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And the really cool thing is, is a lot of people still don't even know that we're here. You know, I've been in practice for 24 years. Dr. Sarah's brand new and we are just, we're here and we want people to know. So please share with their community, share with your family, your friends, your loved ones that we're here, that we're doing these Facebook live mm -hmm. classes. Um, and this is the place to find the answers yes. that they're looking for. Love it. Yes. All right. So we call it a night? We shall. All right. Everybody Good have a night. beautiful night. Thank you for being here. Love you.